All right, guys, I'm going to speed this one up. Problem is, I teach a whole semester class on this here, so I've been telling way uh, too many stories. So we got to speed things up a tad here. So um, when we get to the pictures, um, you can feel free to pause it and look at those at your leisure. Um, but right now, we got to gain some ground, or we're never going to get done with the summer session. So. While all that is going on in the European theater, it's the Pacific theater where America has entered the war. And the first thing that happens after the, after the attack on Pearl Harbor is the Battle of Coral Sea. And at Coral Sea, Yamamoto decided to draw the American fleet into combat to finish it off, to destroy what he didn't get at Pearl Harbor. And it is during this time, uh, the Americans sink a couple Japanese ships, the um, Japanese sink a couple of ours, and it is a new type of naval battle where the ships don't fight each other, it's done by airplane. And one of the, plane, the ships the Japanese thought they had sunk is the mighty aircraft carrier, the USS Yorktown. And the Japanese thought they sunk it, but what nobody knows, the Yorktown is badly damaged, but still afloat. And so Coral Sea is considered a draw. And it's at this time that the Japanese begin to suffer from hubris. They hadn't been defeated, whether it was in Asia or you know Singapore or Coral Sea or wherever they had been fighting um, in Asia, they had won. And Admiral Yamamoto is going to draw up a plan to finish off the United States Navy. But his plan is intricate. And it will work if everything that he plans happens the way he expects it. But it's going to have a few problems. Number one, a mathematician, United States Commander John Roquefort, will break the Japanese code. This will allow us to understand what their plans are, and he invents a thing known as Roquefort's Ruse to trick them into letting us know they were going to attack Midway Island. Now that we know where they are going to attack, United States Admiral Nimitz has to come up with a battle plan. He is outnumbered. The Japanese have more ships. They're newer than ours. But on his side... He has intelligence. And as he's sitting in his office thinking about what to do, his chief of staff comes in and says, out of nowhere, after being missing for weeks, the Yorktown is steaming back into Pearl Harbor. Nimitz will ask the harbor master, just based on visual estimates, how long it'll take him to fix it. He says a minimum of 90 days. Nimitz says, great, you got 72 hours, get on it. Japanese thought the Yorktown was sunk. Now we've got a, a plan. And so Nimitz will scour the island for every welder and pipe fitter and carpenter and slap them aboard. For his new plan to work, Yorktown has to be in front of Midway Island before the Japanese scouts get there. They believe it's sunk, so now it's going to throw a wrench in Yamamoto's intricately crafted plan. Well, the, Yama, the Yorktown is going to get to Midway just a few hours before the Japanese. And they radio back, hey, the Yorktown is present. But Yamamoto had all of his radio masts lowered, so they do not get that communication. And on June the 3rd, Ensign Jack Reed flying a spotter plane, Strawberry 9, spots four of the six large Japanese aircraft carriers coming right from Midway Island. On June the 4th, the Japanese will launch their first attack. And the Japanese planes are bombing the Marine outpost and the Marine runway on Mid Midway Island. As they do so, they radio back, hey, wait a minute, we thought we sunk the Yorktown here she is, but she looks badly damaged. And the Japanese think, oh, they're leaving her there to repair it. 
On the decks of the Japanese aircraft carriers was the second wave of planes getting ready to take off. Well, their captain will make a crucial mistake. He will say, instead of loading them with high-altitude bombs, have them loaded with torpedoes. The second wave will take off and attack the Yorktown. As the first wave of pilots come back, they will land. We will refuel and put the high altitudes back on them and send them back out. So on the deck is going to be unused ordnance, the high explosive bombs, and highly flammable airplane fuel. That's what's going to happen. Well, this is going to be the big mistake. As the first wave comes back in, they're going to reload, and there is the picture of the Yorktown coming back into harbor. Well, as the second wave takes off, right, the first wave of the planes are sitting on the decks when Nimitz springs his trap. What the Japanese didn't know was 160 miles to the north, the Enterprise and Hornet are hidden. The other, the two of the three aircraft carriers we have, the Enterprise, the Hornet, and the Yorktown, the ones that were at Pearl Harbor, well, two of them are hidden. The Yorktown is bait, and planes will launch from the um, Enterprise and Hornet, and as the Japanese are defenseless, the planes are on the deck, are getting ready to go in for a landing, the American airplanes arrive above them. And there's so much more to this story. Unfortunately, we don't have time to get into it. At 10.13 a.m., Vice Admiral Chichi Nagumo radioed that victory is imminent. He is about to take out the United States Navy. Well, at 10.28, right, it's 15 minutes later, the pendulum has swung. The American bombers bombing from 20,000 feet bomb the Akagi, which catches fire and just disintegrates. The Kaga is hit by four bombs and turns into a flaming inferno, boiling the seawater around it. The Soru sinks. The Hiru turns and heads back towards Japan. Its planes were bombing the Yorktown, but it was tracked down one hour later and it was sunk. It was the end of one of the most dramatic battles in all of World War II. It doesn't last very long, but it's very decisive. The United States loses just 147 planes and 300 soldiers and Marines. The Japanese lost things they could not replace. Four state-of-the-art aircraft carriers, hundreds of airplanes, and more importantly than that, the highly trained pilots and flight crew chiefs and mechanics, 3,500 of the very best that the Empire of Japan had. And so after Midway, Japan is no longer capable of offensive action. She had her empire, but all she could do at this point was hang on to it. Which means it's going to be a long and bloody war, but the victory in the Pacific is just a matter of time. And this allows the United States to help out England and pursue a Germany first policy. So, shortly after that is the first ground battle. It will pit United States Marines versus the Japanese Marines. It was supposed to only last a couple weeks. The battle for Guadalcanal will last six months and claim 300,000 lives. All right. Guadalcanal is a small island. It sits right in the gap during the shipping lanes between Australia and Hawaii. That we had to keep open. And so on August 7th, 1942, just eight, nine months after Pearl Harbor, the United States Navy shells the island and sends in 11,000 Marines. The Marines expected the landing to be tough, but they're shocked when they almost walk ashore. Right? The Japanese there were mostly construction workers, and they fled to a nearby island a little bit to the north known as Tulagi. And the few Japanese Marines we did encounter, guys were shocked they didn't surrender. They kept fighting. They had to be eliminated. And so very quickly, the United States captures the Japanese airfield on the island, 
using captured Japanese equipment and we figured that hey now that we've got the airfield we're, we're, we're going to be sitting pretty but the Japanese rush in reinforcements they want that island back so the Marines are going to land here in the south end they're going to walk north up here by the Tenaru River and the Matanakau Peninsula the Japanese are going to come in every night with reinforcements. Now the Japanese have command of the air and ground forces so they begin to bomb the United States soldiers on Guadalcanal. And the night after the first landing using English speaking sailors the Japanese Navy sneaks into the United States fleet and blows it up. There was a huge battle. Marines on shore were screaming and cheering believing they had won. The next day they're shocked to wake up and see that they had been abandoned with all of their supplies. And so both American Marines and Japanese Marines are going to spend the next several months on the island. Um, they're going to have to battle intense heat, monsoon rains, little food, and more than that, devastating malaria and dysentery. And so the Americans were surviving off 100-pound bags of Japanese rice that they captured. And so right after the landing is the famous battle near Tenaru River, um, or a little tributary known as Alligator Creek. The Japanese had been told that they were invincible and that the United States were spiritually weak, we were afraid of the dark, and poor at hand-to-hand -hand combat. Well, at Alligator Creek, the Japanese began what is known as a bonsai charge, an all-out attack. And the United States Marines chopped up 777 of the 900 attackers. 777 are killed outright. Most of the others are wounded. And the Japanese learned very quickly that the, the United States Marines were not afraid to fight, and they were not afraid of the dark. And so the battle then shifts from Alligator Creek towards the airfield. And here is Henderson Airfield down here is the Marines slogging their way through the jungle and this becomes known as the Battle of Bloody Ridge where 700 United States Marines are going to take on 4,000 Japanese soldiers. The Japanese running low on supplies begin to suicide charge and they attack the Marines at multiple vantage points and the Marines are strung out Slowly they're being pushed back towards the airfield, dangerously low on ammunition. Near the end, the fighting becomes vicious. A lot of it was hand-to-hand, -hand, man to man where a young guy from New Jersey, John Bazalone, will win the Congressional Medal of, of Honor. Finally, the United States Navy reappears with the United States Army soldiers with brand new equipment and the Japanese are forced to call off the attack on Peleliu where they lost 23,000 of the best soldiers the Empire of Japan had left. And we learn here that the Japanese soldiers um, didn't have a Western mindset. They would rather die than be taken prisoner. If American corpsmen went to help them, they would blow themselves up. So the American Marines had to learn the nasty policy known as kill it twice. And out of the viciousness and loss of life we experienced at Guadalcanal, we realize it'll cost too many lives to fight island to island to island all the way to um, Japan. So out of the viciousness of Guadalcanal, we decide on a policy of island hopping, leaping four or five hundred miles ahead and cutting off the Japanese Marines who have been abandoned on the islands in the middle. So the Marines at Guadalcanal, here's the beach at Alligator Creek with the first big hardcore battle. And <clears throat> we're going to jump back to the European theater um, at this point, where we're going to get to be what is known as the most important day in the history of the 20th century. Oh, excuse me there for the zoom. All right, the most important day of the 20th century. We are going to recapture um, France. And then Hitler is going to try his last gas battle 
in the Battle of the Bulge there. So hopefully you guys can see this. Okay, all right. So um, June the 4th, Dwight Eisenhower is going to issue this letter. Soldiers, sailors, airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the Great Crusade to which you have striven these many months. All right, We really don't even know what is going to happen. This is a desperate gamble that is being committed by the Allies. And that is how Eisenhower saw this. The, the head general, wish we had more time to go into this, as a great crusade. He says, the eyes of the world are upon you. Liberty-loving people everywhere are marching with you. And he is going to launch the largest invasion of the European continent in all of world history. All right. The only thing that comes close to it is the invasion of Emperor Xerxes in the famous Greek-Peloponnesian Wars back in the 480s BC, where the British, Canadian, American, and other Allied troops are going to hit the beaches of Normandy, which have been specifically prepared to defend against by Erwin Rommel. An amazing, intricate series of defenses deep out into the ocean, three or four hundred yards. Then a three or four hundred yard beach that they have to cross, coupled by these giant things. These pink things are known as Wilderstan nesters, resistance nest, as they go up the four draws off of Omaha Beach. Our objective is to get inland so we can then liberate the continent of France from the darkness of Nazi tyranny. So I'm just going to leave these pictures here and you can check them out at your leisure. Well, the United States troops were told that an American Army aerial bombardment and a naval bombardment would eliminate all the German defenses and obstacles in front of them. Both the Army and the Navy widely overshot. And so when the 29th Division, the Blue and Gray Division, landed at 6.32 a.m. on Omaha Beach, you can see young Private Charles' neighbor here, <clears throat> said we became an instant visitor to hell. Average age of the American GI on the beaches was 18 to 22. They were going to be assisted by paratroopers who were going to land behind enemy lines and capture the key towns of Carentan and St. Mary Glaze, linking the beachheads, and prevent the flooding of these lower fields. Well, 95% of the Allied soldiers landed in the wrong spot. Only the British 6th Airborne, um, Major um, Otway and Major, or Colonel Otway and Major John Howard, will land where they are supposed to at the eastern end of the beachhead. Some of the cliffs the American soldiers had to climb are very steep. Here you see um, Utah Beach right underneath Pont du Hoc. That right there is me with the tide coming in very, very, very rapidly. This is not an easy ascent, especially with Germans over top um, taking shots at you and throwing hand grenades down at you the entire time. And here's one of the greatest primary documents um, of the day, taken by Robert Sargent, and you can see the darkness of the smoke, the storm clouds, and what is very deceptive is the beaches off of Omaha. You see this guy is like thigh deep, and a couple of feet away, guys are up to their chests, all right? There are these deep little rivulets in, in the water that made it difficult to move, and you see how very far the soldiers have to go to get out of the water on D-Day. This is the beach um, around 6.45 um, a.m. where I had just almost um, drowned coming ashore trying to reenact this whole thing. Um, when it was all said and done, Hitler had built an elaborate system of defenses that was designed to repel the invasion. Well, through sheer tenacity and grit, the American, Canadian, British, Free French, Free Polish soldiers will crack the Atlantic Wall, Hitler's fortress, by 930. 
We only get 150,000 soldiers ashore that day, but we finally liberated conquered Nazi territory. From then on, the big push will break out from Normandy, fight through the hedgerows, sweep across France, and will land us in the late summer, early fall on the German border, where a supply crisis hits as we did not have enough gas to fuel three armies. British led 21st Army by Bernard Law Montgomery, the American 1st Army by Omar Bradley, and the 3rd Army by George Patton. Several screw-ups will happen in the Flays Gap in an Operation Market Garden, Battle of the Hurtgen Forest, which brings us to the decisive Battle of the Bulge. This was Hitler's last gamble in Western Europe. It was designed to secure peace with the Allies, to split the American and British Army in half, so he could then devote his resources on fighting the Soviet Union. He was going to drive the British back into the English Channel and hope that we would quit. Since the summer of 1944, Hitler had been fighting on multiple fronts. He's fighting the Allies in France after D-Day and the Soviets in the East. The Allies have broken through and on their, they're on the borders of Germany with the Soviets closing in on Berlin. Hitler knew there was no chance he could strike a deal with Joseph Stalin, so making peace with the Allies was the only shot he felt that he had. To make this happen, he had to, in his mind, kill so many Allied soldiers that it would not be worth fighting all the way to the Rhine. And so, not expecting an attack in the winter, in the lightly held sector by the thick, dense Ardenne forest, an attack comes out of this area early in the morning, and this area was not good for tanks and motorized vehicles. That's why Hitler chose, it was called Wacht on Rhine, Watch on the Rhine. And... On December 16th, these three panzer armies explode out of the forest and they begin their attack. Their goal is this red football-shaped area. Instead, all they get is this orange area by the famous town of Sells, Bastogne, Hufelais, and St. Vith. It's going to be led by legendary German commanders. Right? Otto Skorzny and Frederick von der Heidt are going to parachute with specially trained English-speaking German commandos to harass the American army. They're going to use captured uniforms and vehicles to spread chaos behind enemy lines. As a result, American reinforcements coming to the rescue were misdirected. Some of them went in circles. And most of the soldiers holding defensive positions were brand new. They were green. They were put there specifically to gain experience. And while most of them broke and ran, there were enough little groups, 10, 20 here, 15 to 30 there, that put up shocking amounts of resistance. There was a man by the name of Lyle Bach with his intelligence and reconnaissance platoon. 13 guys will, will hold the town of Stave Low, a key road and bridge the Germans needed for nearly a day. The problem when this happened is the American high command was told when the attack happened that there was a major attack. And they said they, that it's got to be a mistake. It just can't be possible. Well, unfortunately, it wasn't. And since small groups like Lyle Bach's men fought so hard, the SS troopers, being led by a guy by the name of Yakin Piper, began to shoot unarmed American prisoners, like the 150 guys who were shot in the town of Malmendi. When the reinforcements saw that, they began to fight even harder and more tenaciously. Here is going to be the leader of the German SS, a guy by the name of Jochen Piper. And Jochen Piper chose for his symbol the um, skull, the crossbones, and the snake. It's J.K. Rawlings' dark mark. And here is an example of these tiny towns, not good for tanks. 
Here is the roadway here and this road curves around. You can see this rectangle here is this thing right here. Swings around the mountain and the castle and goes over this tiny bridge. Well, on the other side is where the Americans are going to defend that bridge till they get up on top of here, a place known as the Ellsbourne Ridge. And here is the attack in the forest. This millions and millions of pine trees were planted. So it's hard to tell where you are. And these roads are tiny. I'm on the bridge that I just showed you. And the German tanks, their treads were scratching the, the, the stone walls on either side. And the Battle of the Bulge is vicious. There I am in front of General George S. Patton's grave. And here is the outline of the Battle of the Bulge around this little town of Bastogne. And so as the Germans attack on the 16th, it takes a couple days for the Allies to rush reinforcements. And on the north end of that area is known as the Ellsbourne Ridge, close to the key towns of Three Bridges, Hufalais, and, excuse me, St. Vith, excuse me. Mm. The Americans called it Skyline Drive. It's riddled with glaciatic streams and rivers and, and, and cliffs, and the fighting here was brutal for both sides. The one thing the Germans did not have was gasoline. So they were on an intricate timetable to capture these supply depots. What this did was it slowed down the Germans. A lot of time was taken to capture these supply depots, and many United States soldiers lit them on fire or blew them up before they could be captured. This gives General Troy Middleton time to cobble together some type of a defense. And he grabs everyone, secretaries, cooks, dishwashers, bakers. He slapped them on the front line with an M1 and said, we are going to fight right here. Dwight Eisenhower, looking for reinforcements, realized the only thing he had were the beleaguered 82nd 101st Airborne Divisions who had just come out of the Netherlands from the failed Operation Market Garden attack. And they are immediately sent into the battle. The 82nd will be sent to the town of Stave Low, and the 101st will be sent to the key crossroads town of Bastogne. Here they will fight tooth and nail for the next several weeks in absolutely horrid, brutal conditions. They were not given any cold weather gear. Since everyone thought the war would be over, the cold weather clothing was repacked and sent back to England. So the U.S. soldiers go into the brutally cold winter in snow like this with absolutely no winter clothing or shoe packs. The freezing cold, the mud, the snow, and the rain played havoc on the men. The winter of 1944 was the coldest recorded winter in Europe in the 20th century. Feet, not inches, but feet of snow fell, and the temperature ranged between 0 and 35 degrees below 0 the entire time. Guys couldn't light a fire. They couldn't cook hot meals. They could not give away their positions. And so small numbers of paratroopers fought off heavily armed and armored Germans all around Bastogne. Three German divisions, several thousand men tried to dis dislodge them, but they couldn't. And on December the 22nd, the United States soldiers were asked to surrender. A young lieutenant came forward and said, hey, um, you know, we want to discuss surrender terms. And the American general, Anthony McAuliffe, said, what, you guys want to surrender to us? And the German was like, no, we want you to surrender. And he said, whatever. He gave him a one-word answer known as nuts. You know, I mean, like, go to heck back, back in the day. And as a result of this, the Germans attacked even harder on Christmas Eve. They sent in everything they had and were beaten back every time. Here are just a few guys cobbling together a defense with one artillery piece and a bazooka. And here is Lyle Bach, who will turn 20 on December, the night of December 16th, 17th, when he is captured. Um, 
Well, seeing all of this happening, a couple days earlier, General Patton diverted his army that was 100 miles to the south and turned them north. He doesn't get there on Christmas Day, but he arrives on December 26th. If you talk to any members of the 101st Airborne, they claim that they didn't need Patton. They were doing this fine on their own, but it didn't help to have tanks and infantry support. After this, the weather begins to clear. The United States airplanes can begin to fly, and Hitler's attack is stalemated. Now, the bulge isn't completely compressed until February, so it's going to take months to get us back to the original starting point. But the Germans will lose 100,000 of their best fighting men they had left, and more importantly, 800 brand spanking new vehicles that they could not replace. And the Battle of the Bulge is one of the greatest battles ever fought by United States forces in just completely appalling conditions. But the U.S. soldier had endured, and the way to Germany is finally open. And so here is Anthony McAuliffe um, after he just gave the letter nuts to the Germans. And here is the Bastogne sign he was standing behind. And here is one of the Panther tanks, like a giant trapezoid that you can still see in little areas of the Battle of the Bulge. Here is a big tiger in the town of Hufalais where it just sat. It's big 105 millimeter cannon. And here are some foxholes. If you've seen um, Band of Brothers, here are Easy Company's foxholes outside the town of Foy that you can still go and see. And there is the Bastogne sign, the real Bastogne sign that Anthony McAuliffe was hanging out by. So credit to the airborne paratroopers here. And there's a great story of this tank. This is the tank that made it the farthest into the bulge when it ran over an anti-tank mine in the snow. And a young, little young lady who's known as the Maiden of Cells ran out and told the owner, um, see that her parents owned the little cafe there, told the Germans that she had seen the Americans dropping mines all over the snow-covered road. Believing her, the Germans decided that was it. It was time to begin their retreat. While that was happening, um, Germany was being bombed relentlessly. The new attack airplane with detachable extra disposable fuel tanks, the P-51 Mustang, now has the distance to protect B-17 and B-24 bombers deep into Germany. And the city of Cologne, the industrial city of Cologne, will be bombed 22 times. The landmark for the bombers was the town cathedral, which was pretty much the only thing that survives. The big city of Dresden was bombed for three days during the, 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 the spring. And it badly catches on fire, and mythology likes to say there was no military targets there, as a lot of people burned. But in reality, there were 127 factories and a major railroad artery. So Dresden was a legitimate target. It is a guy by the name of Sir Arthur Harris who is blamed for the firebombing. However, it was not the Royal Air Force. It was both the Royal Air Force and the United States Army Air Force that bombed it. It caused a massive fire that incinerated many of the people in bomb shelters. And Dresden was defended by nearly a million men and hundreds of thousands of anti-aircraft guns. When it came to the Normandy beachhead landings, Erwin Rommel only had 500,000 men to defend all of France. So with double that in Dresden, you see how important that it was. And it was during this time, that's the only time the Messerschmitt 262 was able to get into the air. And as fast as the P-51s were, the Messerschmitt 262 is the um, world's first jet-powered fighter plane. And it shoots the P-51s out of the sky for about 20 minutes. So here is a nice picture of an American B-24 um, saturate carpet bombing a town in the background. This is Dresden. This is, and you can see the only thing that's left 
is the town um, cathedral. This is what it looked like on the ground. So it's a horrible, ghastly sight inside the city of Dresden. Nearly the same time, it is easy company of the 506th Airborne that will find the very first concentration camp in the town of um, Ordorf. Um, when they discovered it, they did not know how to describe what they had seen. They radioed their commander, who shows up with Generals Patton, Eisenhower, and Bradley. And when George Patton saw it, he vomits, and he makes the town mayor and his wife walk through the camp. Both of them denied its existence when they saw it. They went home and hanged themselves. About a week later, Buchenwald, one of the largest concentration camps, was liberated. A day later, Nordhausen, and then on April 15th, Bergen-Belsen will be liberated. It was one of the very worst, and it will be um, where Anne Frank um, perished. A lot of these camps were in the middle of absolute nowhere because nobody wanted to admit their existence. But just outside of Munich is the concentration camp Dachau. And when the soldiers saw this, it reinforced their vigor to end the war. Here are the three generals as they come to see the concentration camp at Ordorf and some of the horrible things that they saw. So um, here, this is um, the Anne Frank house. This is the secret stairwell behind um, the bookcase. And this is the oak tree. Um, it's a seedling that she looked out over her, win her window before being taken um, prisoner. So while all that is happening, Hitler is in Berlin. And the air raids on the city makes him move to the Fuhrer bunker. The Soviet soldiers were 50 miles away, and Stalin ordered his ace general, Yorgi Zhukov, to take Berlin. The United States was holding. We did not want to lose the amount of soldiers it would take to capture Berlin. If the Soviets wanted it, go for it. Defending the city were 200,000 Germans and 1,500 tanks. Zhukov and the Soviets will attack relentlessly. Um, it'll cause them mass casualties, but they keep attacking and attack, attacking and attacking, and eventually they are able to break through. On April 22nd, Hitler, knowing the Soviets are just outside, orders his staff to evacuate, and as the Soviets enter Berlin on the 25th, Hitler um, will go back into the Führer bunker and dictate his last personal and political testaments. Um, early in the morning of April the 30th, he will marry his longtime girlfriend, Eva Braun, with the Russians literally a quarter mile, this blocks away. Eva Braun will take poison, and Adolf Hitler will shoot himself, and his body will be burned. It'll be a couple days later that Major Vladimir Nik Nikolina will climb the Reich's chancellor Chancellery, take down the Nazi flag, and raise the Soviet flag above the city. Between the last three weeks of April and the first couple days of May, it cost the Soviets 305,000 lives to capture the prize of Berlin. There is the Reich's Chancellery, and here is Major Nikolina. I think it's just a great photo, even though it's Soviet flag over, and you can see how bombed out and destroyed the city actually is. Um, after Hitler's suicide, the next in command is Admiral Donitz, and he orders all of his armies to surrender in the West so that Germany could turn and fight the Soviets. And Eisenhower says, no, 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 you can't just have your guys surrender to me and go fight these Soviets. I want unconditional surrender of every German army in the East and in the West. And what was happening, a lot of the German um, common folk were fleeing the Soviets and running to where the Allied lines were for safety. 
And Eisenhower says, if you keep this up, I will not let any more of your refugees through our lines. It's going to be unconditional surrender. So at 2.41 a.m. on May the 7th, General Alfred Yodel will state that effective on May 8th, all German troops fighting any army anywhere will surrender. This will give time for Yorgi Zukov to fly and get to the surrender ceremony, and at 10.43 p.m., the war in Europe was over. There's Yodel and Donuts. There they are signing the surrender. Eisenhower has multiple pens, and the celebration is about to begin. Um, it's going on in New York City. That's awesome. But there's still problems going on in the Pacific. After that, after the horrible battles of Saipan and, and Okinawa and Iwo Jima, President Truman will make the very difficult but, but only decision he could make to drop an atomic bomb on the city of Hiroshima. Estimates to invade the Japanese home islands were anywhere between um, 2 and 5 million people, citizens and marines. So on August 6th, the first atomic bomb is dropped on Hiroshima. The Japanese are asked to surrender, and they say no. A second bomb was going to be dropped on August 9th. Its primary city was covered in fog, so Nagasaki will receive the second atomic bomb. After that, Japan surrenders September 2nd aboard the USS Missouri. Now, bringing the atomic bombs there is an interesting story. The ship, the U.S. Indianapolis, will deliver the atomic bombs, Fat Man and Little Boy, to the island of Tinian. Its mission was top secret. On its return leg, the Indianapolis was sunk, and as it was then sunk, um, it was not reported missing for a week, where a thousand of her crewmen were drowned or be eaten by sharks. It was terrible. So, um, we had been firebombing the Japanese. We had tried to blockade the Japanese to get them to quit, but they wouldn't do it. So when the bomb falls, it blows up five square miles and 120,000 people, 40% of the population of Hiroshima. When the Japanese said no, um, we were forced to drop a second one. The guy that dropped the bomb, Paul Tibbetts flew the Enola Gay, was a guy named Tom Furby from Moxville, North Carolina, who dropped the bomb. He's the one who said, oh my God, what have we done? The soldiers just thought it was a really big bomb. And after that, Robert Oppenheimer gives his famous quote, I've become death, the conqueror of worlds. We knew it would be big. We didn't know it would be that big. Here's the USS in Indianapolis, one of the few pictures um, that remain of it. It was just a horrible, horrible tragedy. Um, there is Oppenheimer, um, Tibbetts, and um, Furby in front of their famous plane. Um, there are the atomic bomb mushroom clouds, and that is what the Japanese cities will look like when they are done. Um, Fat Man was dropped a couple days later on August 9th. We dropped it on the back side of a volcano which absorbed some of the blast. But when it's all said and done, 144,000 people are killed or injured out of a town of 270,000. Japan was shocked in disbelief and terror. And we said, hey, do you want to surrender or do you want us to drop a third one? Thank God Emperor Hirohito decided to surrender because we didn't have a third bomb. Now, the Allies will demand unconditional surrender, um, but it is dishonorable to do so in Japan. So it's a very difficult problem for the Allies and the Japanese to figure out how to do this. But Japanese Prime Minister Admiral Kanatoro Suzuki um, was making plans for a final defense while, while attempting a surrender. 
And the big problem that was holding up the Japanese is that we wanted there to be a democracy. Well, the Japanese wanted to cling to their emperor. But the Japanese ambassador in Moscow said, hey, we'll end the war, but you got to keep the emperor in place. You have to make sure he is secure. So we'll do a constitutional monarchy, but we're not going to have a democracy. We sent word that we would allow his throne to be protected, but Japan would be um, occupied. Hirohito surrenders. On August 14th, Believe it or not, the honorable and loyal Japanese tried to lead a coup against the emperor, but it was quickly defeated. And just as in Europe, it took people way far away from the action to realize the war was over. August 15th is known as Victory in Japan Day, as Hirohito announces his surrender. By August 30th, Marines will occupy the mainland, and on August 31st, General Douglas MacArthur arrives to take over. The official ceremony takes place on September 2nd on board the USS Missouri in a ceremony that lasts 23 minutes. Prime Minister Suzuki and the former Prime Minister Tojo are there to surrender, lining every standing um, position as the Japanese will come ashore as every sailor on board the USS Missouri. MacArthur, because he is who he is, positions the ship so the Japanese will have to turn their back to the emperor, something which was illegal to do in Bushido code. I got a great story. Maybe I'll tell you before we end class on Friday. China gets the word of the surrender a week later. Burma or Myanmar on the 13th. Hong Kong, it'll take almost, you know, it'll take two weeks. And Japan will become a United States protectorate. As the emperor helps the American occupation help with a democratic diet and a reconstruction. The war is over. And York Magazine, Yank Magazine, given to all the soldiers, is beginning to print articles about how to transition back to civilian life. Many guys are going to have difficulty with that, as they do right now. Here is General Douglas MacArthur and young Emperor Hirohito. MacArthur makes Emperor Hiro declare that he is not a god, he is just a man like them. And somehow, shockingly, the two men wind up becoming friends. That's it for World War II homeschool style, guys. It was as fast as I could do it. Take a look at those pictures and enjoy and email me with any questions.